So, the medieval hospitals of England were a distinct and evolving concept that spanned a period of over 450 years, proving to be a varied but popular form of social welfare and religious activity, providing shelter and food to the vulnerable, poor and outsiders of medieval society. The first two hospitals in England were founded by Archbishop Lanfranc Frank in the 1080s at Canterbury, and it was only after the Protestant Reformation and the passing of the Chantries Act of 1547 by Edward VI, making illegal the practice of prayers as intercession for the soul, that they transfer, transformed into either the increasingly medical sites or hospitals as we know them today, or secular poorhouses of the post-medieval period. During the course of this paper, I aim to give some brief background to the medieval hospital, and then move on to discuss aspects of the architectural layout of these sites that suggests a unifying frame Uh, a unifying framework um, to how they operated. From this, I'll finish on how this layout links to other aspects of hospital care and what this means to our, for our ability to answer a deceptively simple question. What was the medieval hospital? It must first be pointed out that the modern use of the word hospital has little to do with the original Latin meaning. Hospitales referred to the wide-ranging concern of hospitality to guests and it became closely linked to charity, provided, uh, provided through the emulation of the seven comfortable acts of Christ. Feeding the poor, clothing the poor, bringing drink, housing wayfarers, visiting prisoners, nursing the sick, and the burial of the dead. There were at least 1,147 medieval hospitals um, and almshouses in, in England and Wales, increasing steadily throughout the period to a maximum of 652 operating in the 40 years before the dissolution. They varied in size from caring for two individuals to over 200, although most were caring for between 12 and 25. And it seems that mixed communities, men and women, are quite common. As shown from the distribution here, um, they're fairly evenly spread, apart from sort of an absence in parts of Wales and a sort of sparser distribution in North, uh, northwest England. And they would have been a known and common element of the later medieval rural and urban landscape, but they remain a conflicting and often ill-understood subject in modern scholarship. Most aspects, uh, most approaches to the hospitals have aimed to categorise these sites, either by the, uh, who was cared for, be it the poor, sufferers of leprosy, wayfarers and pilgrims, the sick, the infirm, poor priests and monks, men only, women only, mixed sex, elderly, orphans and so on, or in the architectural layout, invariably with a focus on two specific buildings, namely the chapel, which was the spiritual heart of the hospital, and the infirmary hall or inmates dormitory, which is the physical heart. From this we get designations such as linear, detached, T-shaped, L-shaped, parallel, random or collegiate. Unfortunately this has led to a series of conflicting and uh, often incompatible categorization systems that manage to explain some but not all of the relevant or similar features of each type of site, but which have also failed to articulate why these sites were unified under the term hospital, often ignoring the possibility of an underlying conceptual framework. Um, which has become the kind of focus of my research uh, during my examination of the sites available for archaeological or architectural study, which is just over about 60 in England and Wales, um, from which I present just a few case studies. St Mary Spittle in London uh, was the second largest medieval hospital in England. Originally founded at the end of the 12th century as a small rectangular cell just to the northeast of the main medieval city, it was refounded re in the 1230s in this larger... Um, larger T-shape here. The refounded site ended up housing around 180 inmates at a time, slightly behind St. Leonard's in York, which cared for over 200. The hospital priory served as a key example for how English medieval hospitals um, uh, as served as a key example for uh, English medieval hospitals after excavation by Moller in the 1980s and 90s, and has been used to argue that hospitals develop, hospital development as a whole was restricted by the land available to them at the time by the money that they were given and the liminal role of hospitals in general. The northern cloister uh, developed here, the lack of a full nave and the kind of mixed 150 year development of the site have all been used to suggest that even the wealthiest hospitals, which this was one of them, um, didn't conform to any order or overarching plan uh, as a set of institutions. However, as I hope to indicate in the rest of this paper, this argument has ignored a key element in how the medieval hospital functioned. If we look more closely at the development of the site from the 13th century uh, and 
13th and 15th century, which this represents, there is a creation of a complex of buildings. Um, this is the chapel heart, and then you have a religious cloister that forms here for the canons that are presiding over the religious uh, element of the site. And what was <laughs> the infirmary, which is this part here, um, just becomes a series of chapels, and the infirmary actually gets moved to the side um, and attached to what becomes the women, or what was the women's garden, um, and a set of stables, um, work areas, and you essentially get two cloisters or two sort of courtyard areas. One religious and male right here. One more secular, with more uh, with female servants attached to it. Work areas, and in the middle between the two is the kitchen. Here on the left is uh, some Bartholomews in Bristol. Um, this building down here and this entire kind of foot of land is the original bequest. This building is used as the chapel from the very beginning and areas to the sort of north and west of it are often um, converted to housing for different er um, during different periods. This building here um, wasn't fully excavated or was barely touched but is interpreted to be the housing for the religious men or the priests um, and also travellers. Whilst this building here um, is a two-storey structure that was constructed for the hospital itself at the uh, point of it was created um, with a kitchen and refectory on the bottom floor and on the top floor is assumed to be the male dormitory for the inmates living there. These buildings here are a um, water tower, um, bakehouse, brew house and a granary. Um, and then this area here is the women's dormitory. And again, you get the creation of two courtyard areas. One here is female. Um, and more service orientated. This one is male and more religious orientated. And at the heart of them is a garden area here and another garden area up here, creating two kind of mixed areas. This is St. Mary, um, St. Mary's Hospital, Offspring in Kent. Um, this is the chapel down here. This is the infirmary split in half between male and female. Well, the, they assume that the division between the two sides is probably for men, men and women. This is the religious close um, and courtyard. This is a royal apartment. The kitchen, again, sits between the two elements, and this area is a set of um, bakehouse and brew houses. And the pond here, pond here, you have, again, another split between a courtyard area of religious um, elite and male, and then you have a more mixed secular and um, work area to the other side. On the left here, we have St. Mary Magdalene Partney. Um, this is the chapel area. And although the, the full area wasn't excavated because it was um, for modifications to a road, um, this is the geophysics, which kind of shows up pretty badly. But this area here in the geophysics looks like it is um, another hall. This is definitely the chapel. There were burials inside of it. And this area just to the west, which would be just up here, um, is, a, so, uh, is assumed to be the uh, dormitory area for this site. Uh, St. Giles Brough in North Yorkshire, this building here is the chapel, this building here is um, an associated pilgrim house and dormitory, whilst the uh, west is a further complex for the, the permanent residents of the site, poor inmates who had um, voluntarily entered the site, um, probably with gardens um, and kitchen areas as well. Whilst not being a truly monastic layout with clear cloisters and so on, the trend evident here suggests a demarcation of space, zones of hierarchy and areas of activity that orientate in a manner reminiscent of a church or monastery, structuring movement and access. This shouldn't be surprising since most hospitals had some form of permanent religious community, be it uh, three or four Benedictine monks and a priest at, the, um, at Partney who were caring for the passing travellers on the road, or the formed um, priory of Augustinian canons at St Mary's Spittal that oversaw the religious well-being of the sick, poor, migrants, pregnant women and orphans who stayed there. All medieval hospitals maintained elements of the monastic daily routine, often using a modified form of Augustinian rule to structure living, complete with vows that included chastity and obedience to the house, a uniform or habit for inmates, daily prayer and contemplation. Indeed, virtually all known medieval hospitals encouraged or even required their inmates to pray for the souls of the founders, benefactors and the community as a whole, and many of the char charitable benefactions that were given were provided in the knowledge that prayers for the soul would be given as a form of repayment, uh, aiding the journey to heaven for the rich. These traits can even be seen in those sites deemed secular almshouses in later medieval England, essentially sites that had no permanent monastic community but were still run or had on staff a priest, and they were increasingly popular in the 14th century. Um, 
These sites also maintained a daily routine of prayer, religious service, good living, and specific attire. This here is Brown's Hospital in Stanford. It's kind of a classic example. Um, it was founded in 1485 and is still operational today. Um, this uh, was the dormitory area, the chapel. This is the master's lodging. Uh, this is the um, other male servants, kitchen area, and female servant, uh, servants are up here, all around um, the cloister garden. Now, if we compare it to St. Giles in Norwich, or the Great Hospital as it's sometimes known, again, chapel here, infirmary hall here, location of the chapter house, chaplain's dormitory, master's lodging, kitchen up here, and then gardens, one larger garden in an outer courtyard, um, and an internal cloister. Um, the two are working fairly similarly, despite the fact that one is apparently secular and, apparent, and the other one is apparently religious. Um, so in terms of movement and the operational issues in which they're working, they're essentially working to the same method. This northern association uh, may also have some deep meaning, since uh, the south of a church is usually associated with warmth, life, male, light and day, whereas the north has often been considered to be associated with the parallel opposites, cold, death, female, darkness and night. But, as some of you may have already worked out, there seems to be a bit of a contradiction between what hospital seems to be wanting to do and the association of this northern angle. Um, at the very least, I take it to uh, be used as serving to set the hospitals apart from the monasteries that they're almost mirroring, uh, both using a similar pattern but flipping the spatial association, which would indicate their difference to anyone who's entering the site. It's clear that poverty or an inability to look after oneself was a driving force behind entering these sites, and excavation has indicated that food was likely nutritious, if not always of the best quality. Research by Jeff Egan in 2007 indicated that English hospitals were almost entirely lacking in the material culture of medical care, although um, further work on the cemeteries may hint at a higher than average uh, amount of pathology, disease, or nutritional stress evident, suggesting that if there is medicine being practiced, it's not of the practical kind that we would associate with physicians and surgeons. There are hints of pharmacological evidence at hospitals, such as the use of herbs and spices for medicines, but many of the ingredients could equally turn up in food preparation or our native species to the areas. And documentary sources are incredibly quiet on hospitals actually purchasing medicine or even hiring doctors at all. Invariably, it's also often forgotten that most studies in medieval medicine focus on what would have been only available to the wealthy, not what would have been available to those who had little to their name, or even hospitals that were helping them out and were also often financially unstable. This confusing lack of medical pra practice has led to the emphasis on the attraction of food, warmth, rest and cleanliness to the poor who have been cared for. The actual, the true importance of these elements, as well as the religious activity that is evident on these sites, as well as actual wider medical practice, has only really been connected again in 2007 by Peregrine Horden, who showed links between the activities of English hospitals and non-natural theory, a medieval medical practice attributed to Johannitus or Hunayn ibn Ishaq, a 9th century Arabic scholar whose theories were fully present in the Latin West by the 12th century at the latest, but probably much earlier, which added elements to Galen's humoral theory. His work emphasised the importance of controlling negative emotions that could unbalance the body, the role of food, um, environment, positive mental attitude and spiritual balance in the maintenance of health. The use of different foods, drinks, simple medicines, prayer, contemplation, confession, baptism, the buildings, the structure, the way that you use your time, all seem to kind of form an element of this medical practice, a treatment that was aimed at both the body and the spirit. Such an approach in many ways represents a perfect form of medicine for the poor, requiring minimal individual expenditure in return for a more collective form of beneficial living. Medical practice, but not as we're expecting to see it in a material record. Given the emphasis on environment for contemplation and recuperation in non-natural theory, it's entirely likely that the structured space evident in medi uh, medieval hospitals is underpinning the religious <laughs> activity of this medi um, medical treatment. However, given the lack of medi uh, medical material culture, and that over 55% of these hospitals were caring primarily for the poor, or and another 10% were just concerned with poor travellers, it implies that not just disease, but also potentially poverty and infirmity could be uh, seen as a social or spiritually dangerous, indicators of some deeper spiritual issue or weakness. Thus we can see that the religious quasi-monastic nature of the hospitals, uh, hospital layout emphasises both the physical and spiritual role of these sites for the residents. Charitable benefaction created a physical and spiritual environment of monastic solitude for the secular poor, utilising the power of prayer, religious offices and a godly lifestyle to treat the physical and spiritual ailments of, the, of poverty and disease. 
whilst always also providing a spiritually safe haven for travellers. The lifestyle also meant that those living were also living there were also demonstrably pure enough for their prayers to make a difference. Um, that this is the case uh, shouldn't be surprising, um, but it's the structured space that I want to emphasise on. That's something that's not been pointed out that these are um, clearly structuring themselves in a way that's almost opposed to monasteries. Um, it's benefiting the whole community as a whole um, to provide a sort of space for them to be purified. But this is, I'd also like to point out that this is a, hyper, a kind of a theoretical end point. They're not all working to this, and it doesn't always come to fruition. Um, and there's lots of cases where actually there's lots of abuse going on in these places, um, and the sites don't work. But what I'm trying to point out is that without understanding that there is this underlying framework to them, we can't actually see where any of the differences come. If we have nothing to compare it to, the differences mean nothing to us. We can't understand why they're there. So, although I don't really have a firm answer on exactly what a medieval hospital is, um, I think looking at stuff like this is actually getting us a lot closer. Okay.